Today on Mornings on the Hill, history is being made into new housing. And speaking of houses, the Gingerbread Gallery is back. And we'll hear from a student who's been affected but not infected by the new COVID variant. Plus, hear what SU players have to say about that double overtime win. All that in your weather coming up on this edition of Mornings on the Hill. Good morning, I'm Lauren Helmbrecht. Thanks for joining us for Mornings on the Hill. And I'm Alexis Raleigh. Here are our top stories for today. Coronavirus cases on campus have doubled over the last few weeks. We now have 27 cases among faculty, staff, and students. According to the CDC guidelines, those 27 people should be in isolation. There are no students in quarantine. Only unvaccinated or vaccine-exempt people are subject to quarantine. And just when we thought it was safe to travel overseas, the Omicron variant surfaced. Adriana Rosas Rivera talked to a South African student whose holiday travel plans are now ruined. And graduate student Jamie Bullock was all set to fly home next week to Johannesburg, South Africa. That is, until her flight was canceled. She unfortunately lost her father to COVID in December of 2020, and she hasn't seen her family in a year. And even if she can leave the United States, it's a question of will she be able to come back next semester? Things happen after a year, and so much has changed back home, and I'm so desperate to just go back and be myself again. And... Um, so my, the biggest anxiety, I guess, is that fear of missing out. Thinking about doing this program remote makes me so anxious. I don't think I could cope with that. Bullock said she'll likely spend the holidays with friends in Virginia, and she is just one of many stories of folks impacted worldwide due to these travel bans. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Adriana Rosas Rivera. Police in Michigan are still trying to determine a motive from yesterday's school shooting that left three students dead and eight others injured. The suspect is a 15-year-old who is in, currently in custody but not talking. Authorities say the gun belonged to the family and the, they have hired a lawyer. This is the 20th school shooting this year. Syracuse will soon be home to the first African-American-owned dental supply distributor. Our Critzia Williams is live to tell us how Access Dental Laboratories is inspiring a community to dream big. Critzia? That's exactly right. Access Dental Laboratories actually started out as a home basement project, but is now shining its light here on South Salina Street. It is a company that is hoping to, hoping to encourage African Americans to break the stigma and be something great. There's more, there's more to life, you know, there's more opportunities. There's, there's a lot that can be accomplished in this neighborhood. Access Dental Laboratories is in an area of poverty and low job opportunity. Antonio Chavez is an employee in training. He says this company is what this side of town needs. They uh, associate the better jobs, you know, in different parts of town. Chavez says he believes this job will teach him about leadership, not just in the workplace, but in his personal life. Oh, I, I have a child, so it's definitely something that I want her to see me doing you know, to, to motivate her. Access Dental Laboratory started out as just a vision board and is getting closer and closer to putting their construction hats away and opening its doors. Our core value here at Access Dental Laboratories is adding value to people. Todd Reed is the president and CEO of Access. He says after high school, he worked for a dental laboratory. People would come in hiding their smiles, and when leaving, they couldn't help but smile. I developed a passion for dentistry. Reed says he hopes the community will find encouragement in knowing Access is black-owned, and they too can do something like this. I think it's really, it will be really inspiring to the community just to see something like this to give you know, young people visions of you know, the vision that this is possible and that something like this can be done. Like you know, people that look like us, we can do something like this.
Reed says, by offering developmental opportunities and providing and teaching skills, they can add value not just to the household, but also to the individual and generations to come. Access Dental Laboratories is scheduled to open in January of 2022. For more information about the lab, their goals and job opportunities, make sure you Google Access Dental Laboratories in Syracuse. Live for Mornings on the Hill, I'm Kritzi Williams. Back to you. A 30-year-old rape case is getting new attention this morning. Bestseller author Alice Siebold was a student here at SU in 1981 when she was raped in Thornton Park. She wrote about it in a 1999 memoir called Lucky. Syracuse resident Anthony Broadwater spent 16 years in prison for the rape, but an incredible turn of events when he was exonerated last week. Now Siebold has apologized to Broadwater and according to the site Medium, she says she deeply regrets what he has been through. In her apology, she acknowledged race played a role in the wrongful conviction. It was a double time, double overtime thriller last night at the Dome, and the end result was a good one for SU Hoop fans. James Cotato joins us now with a recap of last night's thrilling win over Indiana. Lauren Alexis, good morning. The buzz is still alive from Syracuse basketball's win last night over Indiana, knocking off the Hoosers' undefeated record after a 112-110 double overtime thriller. The Orange needed this one, to say the least, after dropping their last three of four, and they struggled in the Bahamas. If you didn't watch the game, Syracuse hit 13 threes last night, and it was a full team contribution from tip-off. All five starters scored in double figures for the Orange, and then Joe Girard and the Bayheim brothers all eclipsed 20. It was an incredible game, moving the Orange to four and three on the year. We'll have post-game sound from the guys later on in the show. Coming up here on Mornings on the Hill, don't take all of your winter clothes out at once. Syracuse is going to see some warmer weather coming through this week. Allison Turner joins us with what to expect for the rest of the week up next. Welcome back. It's time to check your weather for today. Allison Turner is live in the studio to tell us what to expect. Happy December, everyone. And to kick off this winter month, we have some chilly weather and a potential for snow showers throughout the week. But first, let's take a look at the current conditions. Make sure you have a nice coat on today because it's 38 right now, but it feels like 32. And the cloudy skies we're seeing outside sure aren't helping. It's also a little windy with gusts around 20 miles per hour. And looking ahead at the rest of the day, it will be in the mid to upper 30s throughout. But if you're like me and you're looking for some sunshine to, you know, raise the temperatures, you have to wait a little while. The clouds are out and they are here to stay throughout the day. The sun is then going to set at 4.30 p.m. and temperatures will remain in the 30s. And heading into the rest of the week, like Lauren said, it's going to warm up tomorrow with highs in the upper 40s to 50s, but it may feel colder as we're going to see showers throughout the day and high winds up to 29 miles per hour. It's then going to cool back down as you can see this weekend and it may be a good time to plan some things inside because it could be a little wet. We're going to see some rain showers throughout each day, so if you do need to go outside, make sure you grab a rain jacket so you can stay dry. We'll keep an eye out on the rain, but until then, enjoy your day and make sure you stay warm. That's all for weather. I'm Allison Turner. Back to you guys. Across central New York, about 18% of the population speaks a language other than English. One family in CNY is using American Sign Language to communicate with each member of their family. Our Mornings on the Hill executive producer, Caitlin Parisi, tells us how ASL has changed their three-year-old son's life for the better. The Siemens family has been bringing their deaf son to Holmi for the past two years. Holmi is an organization that provides programs for deaf and hearing families to learn about the deaf community as well as teach sign language. The deaf community is nothing new for the Siemens as deafness runs in the family. After having a son who is deaf, they knew exactly what to do and started teaching him sign language right away. A deaf child is like any other child. They just need to be given the tools to succeed. Caitlin Siemens is a mom to two hearing children, Weston and Ellie, and one deaf child named Brennan. 
She grew up learning sign and has made her home an active learning space with the ABCs on the wall and even put up posters in the bathroom. Brennan is her youngest and has been learning sign language since she and her husband found out Brennan was deaf. He has been able to communicate with us so clearly, his wants, his needs, um, right from the beginning. I mean, I dare say he s signed his first sign at like two, between two and three months old. By the age of one and a half, Brennan knew more than 100 signs, which is more than a hearing child. If you are getting exposure to language acquisition, they will learn, their vocabulary will be greater than their hearing peers at that age before they're speaking. Jolene Orlando is the executive director at Holme and has watched Brennan improve his sign language over the years. Orlando says there is more to American Sign Language than hand and arm movements. American Sign Language is not English. So it's a combination of sign language, facial expressions, body language. Um, I also refer American Sign Language to telling a story. Orlando says learning from professionals. Eight of the 10 staff are deaf and have bachelor and master degrees. If you want to learn sign language and have a family member who is deaf, you can take a free American Sign Language course at Holme. If you're looking for something fun to do for the holidays, there's a great gingerbread house competition at the Erie Canal Museum. Our own Gabriel Vega went there to take a look. The Erie Canal Museum celebrates the history of the city of Syracuse, but every year for the holiday, part of the museum is transformed into a gingerbread gallery. I went in and looked at all the pieces. They're great works of art, and they look enough, good enough to eat. This is the 36th year for the gingerbread gallery at the Erie Canal Museum. Syracuse people donate these. And here are 32 different pieces. One shows the deep blue sea, while another is a winter wonderland. And this masterpiece is the Willy Wonka Chocolate Factory. Jane Verostek made it with her children. Every year they pick a favorite movie that they have just a real sentimental attachment to and happy memories to. What went into making this wonderful <laughs> Willy Wonka gingerbread creation? I buy like a big giant glob of white fondant and then I hand color all the colors that we use. It's mostly just time of looking at all my pictures I've printed from the internet and trying to make them look like the character. Museum educator Derek Pratt says his favorite gingerbread house is the Glenlock restaurant. So this is a, uh, this is one of the confectioner pieces. It shows the Glenlock restaurant, which formerly existed in Jamesville. There's a few pictures actually showing what the real restaurant looked like. The gingerbread gallery is the biggest funding event of the year for the museum. So the gingerbread gallery is really essential in keeping this museum operating and doing the other great things that we do. Do you <laughs> eat your creations afterwards? I mean, that happens sometimes like, you know, oh, I have to taste this before it goes um. <laughs> <laughs> but sometimes it will happen. I'll have to run out and get some more of something because we've been oh, snacking. <laughs> if you go, you can vote on People's Choice. Uh, they have a People's Choice Award by using a QR code in the museum. Uh, there's one on the wall, so you can go and uh, use it. And in another competition, judges will choose a winner who gets $300 cash. We've got lots of time. The Gingerbread Gallery will, will run until January 9th. I'm Gabriel Vega. Back to you guys. Coming up on sports, Syracuse men's basketball bounces back after a rough stretch in the Bahamas. That and more coming up after the break. Happy December and good morning. I'm James Catato. Syracuse men's basketball have woken up to nothing but coal in their stockings and no presence under the tree after dropping their last three of four games. But the Orange came back to the dome last night and we're hoping to get some Christmas spirits up heading into December when they played undefeated Indiana. 
In part of the ACC Big Ten Challenge, it was the Bayheim show last night. Buddy and Jimmy were flamethrowers, combining for 53 points and leading Syracuse to the 112-110 double overtime win. It was a thriller. Buddy, how would you describe last night? I've ever played in. Um, just an unbelievable fight from these guys. Started, started off up 16 and a half, and we knew this team's too good to, to not give up and keep fighting. So we knew it was going to be a game no matter what, and just everyone made big plays. The Orange will head to Tassie to take on Florida State this Saturday at 4. And if you're talking about Syracuse basketball, you can't go without mentioning Christian Brothers Academy football. Interesting, I know. Syracuse point guard Saimir Torrance. His brother Saier is the star sophomore wide receiver for the brothers, and they're playing in the New York State High School Class A State Final. Torrance has over 600 receiving yards and 11 touchdowns this season. He's led the brothers to a section and region title. The brothers take on Westchester County's own Somers High School this Friday at 3 p.m in the Carrier Dome, so they have a little bit of a home field advantage. Think of Cuse football this season as Secret Santa. Sometimes you don't always get what you want, but maybe after a little while with a gift, it's not as bad as you thought. The Orange failed to clinch bowl eligibility after losing to Pittsburgh on Saturday. They were ranked 17th in the nation. Syracuse hasn't played in a bowl since 2018, so obviously, with five wins, fans wanted the Orange to get that elusive sixth, but they didn't. Some good news, though. Eight of the Orange received all ACC recognition. First team all offense goes to Sean Tucker. He's the first Cuse tailback since Antoine Bailey in 2011 to make an all-conference team. Linebacker Michael Jones and defensive end Cody Roscoe were first team all defense. Roscoe was the first edge rusher since Chandler Jones to make an all defense for the Cuse. Some good company right there. On the third team, freshman, freshman phenom Deuce Chestnut. He had three interceptions on the year and some pretty stylish gloves as well. Then left tackle Matt Bergeron, center Aaron Cervais, D lineman Josh Black, and cornerback Garrett Williams all made honorable mention. Craziest thing of all is that five of those eight players are eligible to come back next season for the Orange. Coach Babers, that's got to make you a little excited, right? They need to get bigger. They need to get stronger based off of some of the results of this game. But we've got the majority of this football team coming back. And with some additions, I think that we can be extremely different and exciting in 2022. Michael Jones is one of five players eligible to come back to Syracuse, but he says he's 50-50 on whether or not he'll take his talents to the NFL draft and adds that decision will come later this week. Guys. Still to come here on Mornings on the Hill, a 200-year-old building is now being restored and transformed into apartments in downtown Syracuse. Stay with us. That story and more just ahead. It's December 1st, and you might be busting out the holiday music or watching some of your favorite movies. Michaela Armstrong is here with entertainment news. You can't neglect your dose of what's going on in the world of entertainment. CNN is suspending primetime anchor Chris Cuomo indefinitely. CNN says new information revealed Cuomo helped his brother, former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, as he faced sexual harassment allegations. In place of Cuomo, a second hour of Anderson Cooper 360 will air on Tuesday nights. A nearly 200-year-old historic building in Hanover Square is getting a makeover. The building has been standing for 42 presidents and 10 wars. Now one developer from Brooklyn with an interest in history plans to bring the building into the future with apartments while keeping its connection to the past. For the last hundred years, this building has been the home to a menswear shop. But if these walls could talk, they would tell the stories of the last two centuries. The Granite Building in Hanover Square is one of the oldest buildings in Syracuse, and it shows in its architecture, original details, and writings left on walls that date back to the 1800s. For the new owner, Gavin Maloney, tax credits make it possible to restore this building, but his passion for preserving its history makes his experience priceless. I can see the craftsmanship in the work. I can see the, you know, kind of, I can imagine the hands working on the, the trim and the, the floors. Uh, so, I'm constantly aware of 
the people who built, you know, who were involved in building, say, a building like this. Maloney plans to renovate the building into apartments and says what was left behind will be brought into the future. Historian Robert Searing says without buildings like this, it leaves the city without an identity. There's something about being able to see, touch, feel, um, really take in that makes things real, more real than words on page, even more real than an oral history. It's something about being there, and you can feel that history in a way that you just can't otherwise. So the more we can preserve, the better, because when you, when you tear those buildings down, all that's left are the memories, and memories fade, and even photographs will eventually fade. Reconstruction of the building will take six to eight months. Owner Gavin Maloney uncovers more history in the building with each step. He says he is excited for the challenge that lies ahead. If you're looking for a good show in a good city, singer Adele is headed to Las Vegas for her residency in 2022 called Weekends with Adele. The singer released her critically acclaimed album 30 in November. Three days after its debut, it was the best selling album of the year. Her Vegas show will run from January to April. Pre-sale tickets for Adele's show roll out this month and I know I'll be getting mine. For Mornings on the Hill, I'm Michaela Armstrong. Go easy on me, Michaela. I'll be joining you at the show. That's going to do it for us here on Wednesday for Mornings on the Hill. I'm Lauren Helmbrecht. Follow us on social media. I'm Alexis Raleigh. Thanks for watching Orange Nation. We'll see you next Wednesday live at Team right here on OTN.